from materials to devices. So. Okay, thanks, John. So, um, yeah, I guess obviously I'd, I would really like to keep things very informal. Um, you know, it's sort of a small group of us here, so, uh, you know, why not have a conversation okay. instead of a one way and information there's delivery? There's um, there's please feel free to uh, ask questions, interrupt at any time. Okay, so uh, I guess before, I, this is just going to be a, a pretty, there's some details in here, but it's also a fairly high level overview. And um, of course, you know, we can't do this work without money and without great students. Here's uh, some past members of my group uh, posing at, at last year's MBE conference that was in, in Cancun, Mexico. Um, and uh, now I'm starting a new group. Actually, two of the most recently hired people in my group are, are sitting here, so it's a great pleasure to meet them and also um, kind of relaunch this effort here at Illinois. Um, I think one of the really special things for me personally is like the incredible history of 3.5 work in general and MBE in particular from Illinois, uh, you know, going all the way back to Al Cho and then to more recently uh, Norman Chang and, and Dan Wasserman's teams over there as well. Um, so much of that work was actually, it was pioneered here and so it's great to come here and be setting up um, to do that kind of research uh, in, you know, for the future now. So um, I give about one or two slides for each little research story I'm going to tell. And here I try to put four little tiny stories all onto one slide, just one picture and a reference. Um, there's a bunch of things I'm not going to discuss today. But I, I wanted to throw these out there just to give an example of um, you know, the kinds of things where uh, one of the reasons we love 3.5s is for high performance. And that's one of the reasons I love 3.5s as well. Um, but there, we, I think we should also constantly keep in mind what is new that can be done. Um, and so one example is um, you know, this idea of trying to make solar fuel. And this is, uh, this is a very collaborative work where we provided essentially a customized gallium arsenide solar cell. And then uh, another team grew epitaxial oxide layers on top of that. And that was capable of generating hydrogen and the strontium, the strontium titanate layer prevented the decomposition of the gallium arsenide layer in the aqueous solution. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, and actually, Linford is doing electrochemical work these days as well. They're not, not fuel generation, I guess, more on the patterning deposition side. But it's all the same uh, physical phenomena. And interestingly, even though uh, as electrical engineers, um, maybe some of us are a little bit shy around electrochemistry, it's all driven by uh, electron hole phenomena in the semiconductors. So in that sense, it's very, it is very much in our, in our uh, ballpark. Um, here's another one uh, that was, that's been kind of interesting. This project is sort of a, a stepchild of, of Illinois because uh, Professor Yoon over here was one of John Rogers' postdocs. And so um, I guess John Rogers came here and got people to think a lot about what, could, what you could do if you could remove three, five layers and place them anywhere you wanted. And so we've also um, been enjoying working on that as well. And, um, and then also, uh, this is an area where we've been growing nanowires, though, uh, slightly differently from the way, like, for example, Xu Ling Li does it. We, these nanowires are actually embedded inside of a solid 3-5 layer. So um, those are just, uh, I just want to try to convey that while we love 3-5 MBE because it works, and 3-5 materials and devices in general because they work and because they're high performance, I think there are also exciting future uh, avenues for exploration as well. Okay, and so um, with that, I guess I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my background in problem selection. And I'm really just here to sort of introduce myself to you all. I think industry uh, uh, interaction is very important. I wish there were more of you here from the companies uh, because I, I have gotten the opportunity to enjoy um, substantive interactions with a few companies, especially as a uh, um, with, uh, in the 3.5 solar area, there were a number of companies that were very interested in working with us. But just a, a note upon uh, of, of where I came from and how I got into uh, 3.5 MBE and solar cells. My background is actually in silicon germanium materials, and that was largely for uh, CMOS type applications, so field effect transistors. So I interacted very closely with people at IBM actually at that time. And uh, you know, I've seen Mark Bohr kicking around here. I, I, I remember I met him in 2003. I'm sure he doesn't remember who I am. Um, and then, of course, it turned out that uh, Intel, um, uh, although they were not saying anything, they were very deep into silicon germanium uh, transistor research and strain research at that time. And it's, I mean, literally, I, I don't think almost anyone in academia, other than maybe Milton, knew about that fact. Uh, it, was, it was a very closely guarded secret. 
So, um, but it was it was it was fun nevertheless. Even though there was like a kind of there it was there was a lot of secrecy around it. It was fun for us in academia because um, to have like scientists at IBM come to me as a grad student and care about my work was like uh, I think a very influential experience for me actually. I would say. Um, so this is uh, this is a particular example here where by controlling defects and growth, we could grow germanium layers on top of silicon germanium. It's a strained quantum well. And it's actually a funny one. It's a quantum well for holes. And then what you can use it for is as a P-channel field effect transistor. So it's sort of like the, um, the group four version of the pseudomorphic hemt. But it's uh, instead of high electromobility transistor, it's high hole mobility transistor. But the hemt uh, abbreviation never caught on. That's a joke there. Okay, hemmed caught on, but hemmed didn't. Okay, so uh, silicon germanium materials are also very interesting for photonics, and um, actually they have a real history for thermoelectric applications, which is harvesting energy off of a thermal gradient. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, and now I've, I've gone from doing that kind of work to doing 3.5 optoelectronics, but the unifying theme is that I'm always curious to look at what devices can benefit from advances in the way we grow and process materials. Um, and so, you know, this, uh, this Algas oxidation thing is just an amazing, like, at this point, literally textbook example of, like, uh, really studying in depth the materials processing aspect, um, where, and it had, like, such a slam dunk device application. So that's, I think that's the kind of thing that excites me as well, although most, most of my work concentrates on growth. And so I kind of draw this inverting amplifier here just as a way of saying, you know, materials have to be our input, and then we make devices from them. And then, interestingly enough, the devices are a critical feedback tool to the materials, in addition to the fact that devices feed the next stage, which is maybe circuits or systems, et cetera. Okay? So that's, that's how I think about these types of problems. And uh, of course, a great interest is always in creating materials platforms that can address more than one application. So uh, although at, um, when I was a grad student postdoc, I mostly actually did chemical vapor deposition growth. And so I'm really excited about the CVD uh, capabilities here. Uh, what I've been studying for the last eight and a half years has been molecular beam epitaxy. And so what we have here is uh, an example where we have solid sources and actually molten sources here. And what we're doing is uh, they're kind of like flashlights. You make them hot, an atomic flux uh, comes out of them. There's no gas molecules in between. It's an ultra high vacuum environment. So that allows you to make very controllable, very repeatable, and very high purity 3.5 materials. And this is our, our mod gen two, which is sitting here in MNTL waiting to be installed um, inside the cleaner. Okay. So, uh, and then, since I'm in the business of growing materials, we are also in the business of characterizing materials. It's a, I think people here at Illinois understand this very well. So X-ray diffraction, all kinds of diffraction type techniques are important. Um, things like ever, ever, anything from photoluminescence to scanning transmission electron microscopy, um, we, uh, we look at a, a very wide range of characterizing other materials. Um, and the main thing is you always need to pick the right tool for the job. Okay? If you need atomic resolved STEM, then you have to do that. If you don't need it, then you shouldn't actually waste your time with it. You should do something that maybe X-ray diffraction is going to give you the information you need in a more efficient way. And um, you know, in the spirit of you know staying interdisciplinary, we also then work on device fabrication and testing. I don't even know who this grad student is, but I just thought <laughs> it was sort of a this is a this is a cool picture taken from my earlier institution. I guess he's just holding up a piece of chrome plated glass right there. Um, but this is an example of one of our solar cells. We lit it up for bias it as an LED. Um, you know, occasional simulation work and uh, mostly different types of solar cell optical and electrical characterization. Okay, so uh, in the, the remaining like couple minutes, I want to talk to you about um, just a few projects we've been doing. This is a really weird one where we've been trying to make solar cells that work at very high temperatures. Okay, and uh, anyone who's taken um, any of the semiconductor classes here at Illinois knows that high temperature is one of the major enemies of semiconductor devices. And it all comes back to Mr. Boltzmann. Okay, so it's that Boltzmann tail just extending, launching its way deep into the conduction band. And that thing puts all those carriers there and that makes everything leak basically. Okay, and that's an exponential effect. There's other weaker effects like increased recombination 
but it's really uh, you know Mr. Boltzmann who uh, screws up semiconductor devices at high temperature. But nevertheless, this was a proposal that claimed uh, that you could potentially realize a 40% efficiency if you could harvest photovoltaic energy while also harvesting heat energy for storage. And that's, that's sort of the weird thing here. And the, the good thing about heat is that it can be stored in these so-called molten salt tanks for relatively low price. And then that's used to drive heat engines like steam turbines. Okay? Um, but this, this uh, system level efficiency was, I think, what made the Department of Energy kind of excited about the idea. And the challenge, of course, this has to be difficult, is that in order for this notional cartoon to work, is you have to have a solar cell isothermal, like touching a 400C collector, and the solar cell has to work. And so that's what uh, a, my, me and my team were funded to do. And uh, this is just a, a couple snapshots of results that we've gotten. Um, we've proven, I think, for the first time that you can actually operate solar cells with high quantum efficiency all the way to 400C. Um, and you get a very big, even though the open circuit voltage goes down a lot because of uh, what Boltzmann said, um, you can see that we can still get very decent performance, you know, maybe about 0.7 volts at 400C. And then an interesting thing is that the effective optical concentration is enhanced at higher temperatures, which can also be uh, predicted, but it was, it was really reassuring to see that happening in practice. So, and what I mean by enhanced is this, this slope, the improvement you get from concentration is sharper at high temperature than it is at, at lower temperature. Okay, here's a, a second snapshot. This is uh, a very funky kind of laser that we, uh, that we grew. And what this addresses is um, there's sort of a lack of lasers in like this window around two and a half to three and a half microns um, that in terms of those lasers can be grown on a gallium antimonide wafer. They can't be grown on indium phosphide wafer. So um, I and actually uh, the former colleague here at Illinois, Dan Wasserman, started to look at this problem. And we designed this, this very funky laser that had uh, careful defect engineering below it and above it, and then hopefully very pristine quantum wells right in the middle of it. OK. And so I think my last story I'm going to show is this slide here, uh, which is this work that we've been doing to grow 3-5 on silicon tandem solar cells. Why do we want to do that is because silicon solar I think we in the 3.5 business know that silicon is almost always good enough, right? 3.5 electronics are faster, but silicon electronics um, are what's mostly in our cell phone, except for the wireless parts, right? Uh, and and the, other, the other really high frequency parts. Silicon solar is similar. It's not as good as material for solar conversion as 3.5, but it, it works extremely well and it's cheap. But it may be a victim of its own success in the sense that the, uh, there's almost no more room for it to improve its efficiency. So the only way to get more market for silicon is to keep making it cheaper, which is good. We should do that. But if you can make it more efficient as well, then we should also look into doing that. And the best way that I know of to attack that is through 3.5 on silicon growth. And here's an example where uh, we actually got a certified efficiency here uh, done by a third party. And uh, we're pretty proud of this. This is a 15% efficient solar cell, 3.5 on silicon, that's uh, driven by this continual improvements in dislocation density. And the, while the 15% um, may, on its own feet, not be a very exciting number to you, it, it was a, a record in its class. And then when the silicon solar cell underneath is activated as an active junction, then this gives us the pathway to greater than 30% efficiency, uh, which is beyond what silicon is ever going to be able to achieve on its own. So I think with that, um, I will conclude and take any questions you have and have a conversation with you.